It looks like we've got one more coming in. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the beginning of our fall series at the National Young Circle. And we're going to be discussing circling the labyrinth. Um, as you may have seen, we had planned to do this as our first in-person event in over three years. But uh, if you're in Nashville, you probably know there is a COVID surge. So um, we decided to do this online for the safety and well-being of all. And um, I'm Karen Harper. I'm the president of the National Young Circle. And since uh, we've taken this uh, summer hiatus, I thought I would reintroduce the board. Um, and then if you all are comfortable speaking, if you would introduce yourselves, uh, where you're from, and if you've ever walked a labyrinth. So in no particular order, I'm going to introduce the board. Um, Adele Tyler, if you would maybe wave or say something if you want. Hello, I'm Adele, and I live in Nashville, but right now I'm in Los Angeles visiting my daughter. And I have walked a labyrinth several times. Linda? I'm Linda, Linda Odom. I'm in Nashville, and um, and I have watched the labyrinth. It's been a while, and I was really looking forward to doing it today. So I'm sorry we we're going to talk about it and think about it and imagine it, but not actually do it today. Mm, yeah, thanks, Linda. Uh, Michael Whitney. Um, I'm Michael Whitney, and I'm here in Nashville, also from Los Angeles originally, uh, where for a number of years I worked on the. Uh, at the Los Angeles Jung Institute, making the uh, what became the film a matter of heart. So, uh, this has been an exciting topic for all of us in, on the board recently. And Gail Prilliman, she's be one of our speakers today. I'm Gail Prilliman. I live in Franklin, Tennessee, and I I have walked the labyrinth numerous times, and and eventually I built one in my own backyard. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to share some thoughts about them today. She's our local expert today. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alan Scalpone. Hi, I'm Alan Scalpone. Um, I'm in school right now for psychology, and um, I have not ever walked a labyrinth, um, but I've certainly read about them for a long time. So um, I'm excited to dig into this and learn something. Thanks, Alan. And Natalie Cox. Hi, I'm Natalie. I have, mm, I, I've walked the labyrinth, but probably not gotten um, from it what I was meant to get, but it was very, um, it felt quite sacred, um, but I just walked it and, you know, sort of meditated while I did it. So I'm excited about today and learning more about it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, anyone uh, in the audience, uh, if you would introduce yourselves and if you've walked a labyrinth or maybe had a, a particularly um, wonderful experience with that. And and where you're from too. If yes. You're yes. Uh, raise your hand or just go ahead and speak if you unmute yourself. Harriet. Okay. I'm Harriet from Flat Lock, North Carolina. <clears throat> when I lived in South Carolina, I lived on a lake and the road ended past my house into the lake. And so I built a labyrinth one time when the lake was very low. So it was so interesting because when the lake was full, the labyrinth disappeared and I made it out of huge rocks. So when the labyrinth, when the water level was down, the labyrinth came back. So um, it, it's, I'm sorry I had to leave it but I couldn't bring it with me to North Carolina. Wow. How cool is that? There's something about it emerging and, and uh, disappearing. I don't know. There's something about that that uh, seems extra special. I don't know, but uh, thank you for sharing. Anyone else like to introduce themselves and where you're from and your labyrinth I'm, experience? Yeah, I'm Gad yeah, Muller and I live in Nashville. I walked uh, the labyrinth that is the, the replica of the, Chart cathedral one mm -hmm. in two different locations uh, numerous times, but for with very um, I guess limited purposes. The, the one there's one now also at uh, St Mary's in um, um, yeah, um, and uh, so I walked that once, 
and and the one at Cumberland Heights, they have have had one for like twenty years. They're out there and outdoors. That's that, that we used a lot with patients. So those are the those are the two that I've walked. Thank you, Garrett. Anyone else? Raise your hand, your icon, or just unmute and <clears throat> say something. Say something. Hey, hi. 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 You want to say something? You want to say something? Yeah. So my name is Lauren and I'm from Nashville, live in Nashville. And I've done the prayer lab. I've, what It was called a prayer labyrinth when I did it at like a women's retreat once. And it was quite the experience. Nice. That's it. Nice. Margaret? I'm Margaret Walsh and I'm from Los Angeles, but I live here in Nashville. I spent many years at the Young Institute there. Um and I have never walked a labyrinth that I remember. And uh, I just really like all the programs I've done here. I'm fairly new to Nashville, although not to Tennessee. My mother and my grandparents and all great grandparents were from Tennessee. So um, I'm happy to be here and learn more. Well, welcome. Great. Anyone uh, else? Hi, I'm uh, Gail Grayson. Mm -hmm. And um, I... Uh, almost got to walk the actual Shard uh, Cathedral uh, Labyrinth. Uh, on Fridays, they uh, half the year, they take the chairs up. And unfortunately, I got there one week after they stopped. They don't do it in the winter. They stop in the fall and they start back uh, in April, I think. And uh, so anyway, I got to walk parts of it, but <laughs> the whole thing wasn't available. But, uh, and I've had... Uh, walked the replicas twice uh, at different places, but not the real thing. And almost got to do the real thing. Hmm. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I forgot to mention I'm from Nashville and I've walked a few labyrinths. And I think the one that was the most special, I mean, they're all meaningful, but a uh, friend of a friend had a labyrinth, built a huge stone labyrinth, uh, on their property in West uh, Nashville. And we were walking in the evening and somebody took a picture and there were dozens and dozens of orbs in the picture. So, <laughs> you know, felt, uh, and I felt it too. Anyway, that was a, that was wonderful confirmation of what it felt like. So, and somebody else had their hand up here. Elizabeth, I think did. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Elizabeth Brown. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I have walked the labyrinth, a very rustic one at Pernul Ridge Retreat Center in Ashland City uh, a few times and uh, have also been very blessed to walk the one at the Franciscan Retreat Center in uh, Phoenix. So um, both experiences were very uh, contemplative and um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm really interested to learn more about the history. So yeah. thank you for doing this. Evans has her hand up. Yeah, go ahead. I'm Evans Bowen. Um, I'm raised in Nashville, but I live near Knoxville now. And I was fortunate enough to walk the Shark Cathedral one in Shark in 2007. And I've walked every labyrinth I can find since, and I'm about to build one on my property. So it's a very timely subject for me. Oh, wonderful. We're all invited, right? Absolutely. <laughs> well, I want to do I want to do one of the more of the classic labyrinths rather than the shard style. I'm going to do more of an organic look. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, anyone else before we start with uh, Adele's presentation? Yeah, this is James Gilligan. Hi, James. Thanks. Go ahead, James. James, you want to say more? Yeah, uh, I had uh, walked the labyrinth in Peru. I was there uh, to to visit Machu Picchu. I I didn't get anything or anything out of it. Um, the uh, the guide there mentioned two stars that were the eyes were in. Um, which forget that that was like just holy cow. It was at night and just it was that part was amazing. 
So I was interested in uh, learning more about the labyrinth and and maybe trying it again and see if I don't have more of a, like a meditative experience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Adele, are you ready to share? Sure. Sure. And I want to say it's, it's really interesting. It, it helps me just to, to uh, have everybody identify themselves and it's nice to know where you're living. And so thanks for sharing that and hearing about your labyrinth walks. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to give you the first part of the presentation, but first I want to mention two events we have coming up in the fall that we're excited about. So in October, on the October 13th, Friday night, James Hollis, I guess he's not superstitious about a Friday the 13th, but he uh, has scheduled to do a talk called Necessary Fictions, a Critique of Our Life Stories. And a lot of you probably remember James Hollis coming to Nashville twice. He's been very um, involved and supportive of our Nashville Young Circle. And then he did an online presentation. So this will be our fourth time to host James Hollis. And he's doing this. Uh, this is a chapter in his book, a recent book called The Broken Mirror. If you would like to get the book and read it, it's excellent. But that, we, he hasn't given us a time yet, but that'll be Friday night, October 13th. Please save the date. And then November, Sunday afternoon, 3 to 5 Central Time, some, uh, November 12th, we will have a book discussion by a woman named Nani Cullerfer. And she edited a book called Storytime with Robert. Robert Johnson tells his favorite stories and myths. And uh, this will be really interesting. Nani was the executive director of something called Journey into Wholeness that some of you may know about, a union organization that Robert Johnson helped start. Robert Johnson and, and James Hollis are, are two of the most beloved union writers. So uh, this he told fairy tales and stories at night at this these conferences, and uh, they were recorded. And then she got various other union people to write commentary on it. So I think that'll be a fun discussion. So on to our discussion. So I'm going to just kind of cover the, kind of an introduction to the labyrinth. It sounds like a lot of you already know a good bit about it, uh, but we'll sort of touch on the history, brief history. Then Gail will talk about walking a labyrinth as a uh, tool for personal and spiritual growth. And then Alan will have a brief discussion of two modern films that have the word labyrinth in the title. So I'm going to cover the gamut today. And then we'll also, Gail will give us some resources on where we can find labyrinths close by and opportunities to walk them. So as we're going through this today, it seemed like to me there were three basic questions that maybe we're going to try to cover. First, obviously, what exactly is a labyrinth? If there's some that are still curious about that. There are different types we'll get into. Why are people in, interested in union psychology, interested in labyrinths? What's the connection there? And then third, why are so many people around the world embracing this return of labyrinths to our contemporary life? What What is the purpose and how did that begin? So as a really easy introduction, I'm going to use a short video clip that was from YouTube that was broadcast a few years ago on, of all places, uh, NBC, The Today Show. So when I was Googling, finding thing, videos about labyrinths, this one came up. So we're going to attempt to show this, if I can make this work. So just hang on here. While I pull it up. This is the tech aspects, most the most challenging part. Okay, here we go. Uh -oh. Do we not have any sound? We don't see your screen yet, Adele. You don't? You share do screen. Do a share screen. Oh, <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> I you this was going to be challenging. All right, hang on. Share screen. Force. Okay. Let's see if I can get it. Okay. Let's 
Still no sound. It's, it looks like the volume is down on the screen. Looks like that. Oh, okay. The town of Carefree. Try again. All right. About an hour north of Phoenix, where the saguaro cactus are abundant, is the town of Carefree. It sounds like a place you'd go to check out for a while. Or maybe check in with yourself. What's this thing? This is a very ancient symbol of how to come back to one's center. A labyrinth, explains Veronica Lynn Clark at the Savannah Wellness Resort. It looks complex, just like mindfulness and all these other things, but it's a very simple pathway to the center. A destination often not easy to access. What if you're afraid of this center? What if you, like, uh, I don't know, this center's got a lot of stuff going on in there. I just, just as soon leave that door closed. A lot of people are afraid of it. Yeah. That's okay. Not everybody's going to want to go right to the center. There's a lot of stuff there. Wellness buzzwords, or is there a there here in the desert? Clark describes it as a kind of walking meditation. Which can be so much more gratifying even for someone who feel frustrated because they can't sit and meditate. Mm -hmm. So this is a very simple way to meditate. Labyrinths, or something like them, have been around for 4,000 years. The modern labyrinth movement started at San Francisco's Grace Cathedral in the 1990s. I was at the end of my rope, so to speak, with uh, the AIDS crisis, and I was just burnt out. After careful study and prayer, the Reverend Dr. Lauren Artris thought walking a labyrinth could soothe a troubled soul. This pattern, if you can allow yourself to just drop in, then you get in touch with this whole other level. We tried it there in that sacred space. Maybe you don't quite get it the first time. It was different in Arizona. Part of that is the relaxing. Part of it is just letting go. This is such a beautiful way for people to practice that. The internal noise, often static, dissonant voices within, began to quiet. The longer we're out here, yeah. the more I wanted to slow down. Mm. A lot of times people will confuse a labyrinth with a maze. Mm -hmm. The maze is intended to create some confusion. But this labyrinth, if you stay on the path, you're not going to get lost. It's a metaphor, a journey. What do you think the labyrinth might be a pathway to? Inner peace. Since Lauren Artris brought the labyrinth to Grace Cathedral, thousands more have been built across the country. Many at churches, including at the Presbyterian Church on the Green in Bloomfield, New Jersey. Pastor Ruth Bowling and her husband Carlos built a full labyrinth during the pandemic. It has brought them and the community here a path to healing. Every experience is different. Every time I walk the labyrinth, it's a different experience for me, but it's always good. It's not that the labyrinth in and of itself created this experience. You allowed yourself to have the experience by walking through. You can still walk mindfully, peacefully, and still experience the peace inside of you. So it's portable. Yes. All right, so that worked at least as well as <laughs> <you know. laughs> uh, So as they said in that uh, video, uh, and we will go into some more of the things they mentioned, like there is a difference in the types of labyrinths, one being more of a maze. And so you'll hear a little bit more about that from some of the others. Uh, the labyrinth design, as he said, was found throughout the world going back at least 4,000 years. That motif itself and something very similar to it showed up even earlier, as early as 13,000 years ago as a decorative sort of thing. But it carved into rocks. Not We're not talking about just the walking labyrinths, just the image of a labyrinth. Rocks, walls, clay tablets. And uh, then, of course, the la walking labyrinths that we'll be focusing on today. 
So I wanted to tell you a little more about the history. And again, I'm going to rely on someone who has made a video about this to give you a short history and some images of different labyrinths. So hang on here. And share the screen again. Okay. Oops. No. Labyrinth. Here we have an example of the Shark Cathedral Labyrinth and a maze, which is on the right. The labyrinth is a single uh, path, or as they call it, universal path from the entrance to the center, and then the same path one would take back out. Um, but the uh, the maze, on the other hand, is a complex um, puzzle, um, what they call multicursal, where there could be dead ends and having to return, and one can get lost in a maze, whereas in a labyrinth is a clear path from the entrance to the center and using the same path to exit. And there are different types of labyrinths in terms of the design. This is the more classical or Cretan design. The uh, Shark Cathedral Labyrinth is uh, the one here. And this might be construed as a Roman uh, design in terms of the labyrinth, although there are other types of Roman designs that are square. Next, a few examples of uh, labyrinths from different places. Uh, the uh, walking labyrinths are an example. This one is in Sedona, Arizona, at the Lodge at Sedona. This is at a Unitarian church in Sedona. Um, I'm not sure. This is a European uh, lawn labyrinth, uh, a rock labyrinth from Scandinavia, I believe, here. And then we see various kinds. This labyrinth here is kind of a cloth or canvas labyrinth, which is a walking labyrinth that one would, it's portable. This looks like it's a labyrinth on a coin, a Greek coin, which is uh, the oldest, perhaps, of the ones we're looking at here. Although the Arroyo Honda one in New Mexico is fairly dated as well. These are That's this one here. This is an older one, much older one. And then the Man in the Maze from Southwest United States is an example. And then this one is from a cathedral in Europe as well. And then over time we find uh, patterns on rocks and other forms of uh, uh, natural features. Then um, the types of labyrinth we talk about here and in our other videos is there's the walking labyrinth which are examples here this one is in orlando florida i'm not sure where this came from but you'll see that this is kind of a paver labyrinth and this is made out of stones these are walking labyrinths the hands or the finger labyrinth is more this is more of a contemporary labyrinth this is a labyrinth etched on a rock that probably was not large enough for one to walk with their fingers but this is an old uh, labyrinth uh, many hundreds of years old Perhaps not a finger labyrinth, but to get you an idea of what designs, there's many designs that you'll find on various uh, choices you can have with walking a labyrinth and selecting the one you find more comfortable. Next week is, is um, well, we have a bracelet here from the Ukraine dating back to 13,000 BCE. Uh, the uh, one etched in stone here is... Uh, probably between the Paleolithic and Neolithic, it's, it's difficult to get a fix on exactly what the amount, the years were, or the ranges of years for these two periods, but the Paleolithic is the older period, which would be known as the Stone Age, where most uh, things would be found in terms of stone and etchings on bones, perhaps, perhaps um, used with flint. And then there are many rock etchings and pottery that come later, which would be in the Neolithic period. Again, you still have stone and are similar, and then this pylos grease etched into some kind of clay material um, that would be uh, from the uh, Bronze Age, perhaps, or later. Next, we find a 5,000-year-old, what appears to be a walking labyrinth in Russia. Uh, this is an interesting uh, labyrinth in that 
uh, an anthropologist in the 1970s suggest, suggested that there's 30 of these labyrinths in this area, which makes it a quite high concentration at 5,000 years um, from 5,000 years ago. Someone suggested that these may have been used to trap fish because the water level was allegedly much higher at the time. However, later uh, research has debunked that idea, and perhaps these look more like they were walking labyrinths from what one can see. Uh, but an interesting kind of design. Those were in Russia, and there were 30 along that coastline. It's just off the shore there. Uh, then uh, the 15th circuit labyrinth uh, here would be found in Sweden, Finland, and Estonia, which were used by fishermen who walked the labyrinths before going uh, out to fish because they believed the symbols would protect them, ensuring uh, wind and a good catch. There's a more full-size labyrinth in Finland and Estonia than anywhere else in the world. There are, there are more of these 15 circuit labyrinths in that area. Here's kind of a seed pattern of what that might look like. Uh, some were built by the Vikings. However, most of them were built by fishermen from around 1500 to 1900 uh, CE. Um, uh, again, walking the labyrinth before going off to the sea was seen as a propitious kind of behavior. Okay, so one reason I wanted to show that, that man's voice I was a little uh, dull, <laughs> so we didn't want to do a full hour with him. But I thought it was interesting, we just went the idea that labyrinth designs have been found throughout the world, in all cultures, uh, throughout history, going back so far, that it, to me that's an excellent example of what Jung uh, based his theory of the collective unconscious on partially that he had done a lot of study and that we were finding these common symbols and images that were appearing in cultures throughout the world led him to this idea that we had something he called the collective unconscious, which is the deepest layer of our unconscious mind that is genetically inherited, that it, all people are born with this innate uh, access to this deep level of consciousness. Uh, and he, Jung said that these universal symbols, like this labyrinth symbol, would show up as an uh, expression of archetypes. And the archetypes lived, reside in the collective unconscious and then are expressed through symbols. So the labyrinth would be one example of a universal symbol. The labyrinth actually, though, is made up of two kind of universal symbols, the first being the circle, which we are really fond of with the Nashville Jung Circle. It uh, was very deliberate that we chose that name because it is a symbol of various things, one being inclusivity of, you know, trying to uh, bring people together in the community. It's also a symbol of wholeness uh, that Jung talked about a lot with mandalas. It's a symbol of eternity. It's a symbol of the feminine and the goddess as a container. So this is one of the archetypal symbols. The other symbol that you find in the labyrinth is the spiral. And the spiral is an organic shape that shows up throughout nature. Uh, coiling snakes on seashells. Uh, oh, whirling water like hurricane or a tornado. So that is another sort of symbolic shape that you'd find uh, that could be considered archetypal. So the labyrinth then is really two symbols. It's a spiral within a circle. And a little bit more history. I thought this was interesting since we're going to kind of focus the rest of the talk on walking labyrinths. So walking labyrinths were created uh, in 22, it said, of, I read of 80 medieval European cathedrals in, during the Middle Ages. Only three survive, all are in France, with perhaps the most famous being the one several have mentioned at the Chartres Cathedral. It was sometimes called the Road to Jerusalem because uh, it was used as a substitute uh, pilgrimage for people, for Christians who were not able to make an actual pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And they would do this walk as a symbolic pilgrimage. There's a lot more that we can say about these labyrinths and a lot of history. If you want to know more, 
just go on YouTube because there were several hour or more long talks about this. But um, we are going to also give you some links to some resources. But now I'm going to turn it over to Gail. And Gail's going to talk to us about walking the labyrinth and how that might be used. So, Gail. Thank you. Thanks, Adele. Um, I, I think I'll begin by saying that a, a one-page list of resources is in the chat. Hopefully it's posted. And Adele will also include that in our next newsletter. Um, and the, there's only one book on that list, and it's my favorite, uh, the one by Lauren Artris that you heard speak in that first video clip. It's called Walking a Sacred Path. And she goes really into a lot of the history of the labyrinth. And um, she is the Reverend Lauren Artris. She's a clergy person, also an analyst, which is an unusual and wonderful combination for us. And she um, is really credited with starting the revival of interest in our country in labyrinths. There, there is a worldwide revival of interest. But in the mid-90s, she um, had a canvas labyrinth made for the uh, cathedral there in San Francisco. She made a, a trip with several church members, cathedral members, to Chart, Chart Cathedral in France. When they came back, they made a tapestry labyrinth in the floor of the cathedral there. And then a couple of years later, they made um, a stone labyrinth in the meditation garden at the cathedral. And so now, all these years later, um, it's amazing how many labyrinths there are. And that brings me to my the second web uh, resource. There are two websites. One is Veritatas. I won't spell that, but it's the Worldwide Labyrinth Project that Lauren started. And if you go to that, they have trainings. If you want to be a facilitator, there's a wonderful thing called the Worldwide Labyrinth Locator uh, that's on this website. And you can key in a, a zip code or the name of a town, and it will bring up labyrinths that are in that vicinity. And so when I Googled, or when I entered Nashville in a 25-mile radius, 14 labyrinths came up for our area. Most are public, uh, either in churches or the one at Scarrett Bennett is like a retreat center. Um, but that's a wonderful tool. When you go on vacation, you can pull up the city or place you're visiting. You might be surprised how many are there and how many are open to the public. And even people who have them on their private property will often list them, and um, they're, you can visit by appointment. So it's really great. I have friends who visit lighthouses as their bucket list item. And for many of us, visiting different labyrinths serves the same purpose. And then there's another website, um, the Labyrinth Society, which is also very active. Um, they have a, a little bit more of a broader uh, net than maybe uh, the Veritatas website, but both are very interesting. And they also sponsor a, an annual gathering of labyrinth enthusiasts. The other thing I listed, which I, I really wish we could share, but it's a, almost an hour-long video by a man whose name is Lars Howlett. And he began as a professional photographer at a college and got so interested in the labyrinth, which was on the grounds of the college, that he is now 10, 20 years later in charge of building labyrinths and very much has made that his career, which I think is fascinating. Uh, and then at the uh, our local resource, Scarrett Bennett, there's a mention, and this is very important, on Saturday, October 7th, from 7 to 9, there's a free facilitated labyrinth walk at Scarrett Bennett, and they have a beautiful outdoor, huge labyrinth that a group can actually comfortably walk. Not all labyrinths have wide enough lanes that you can have 10, 15, 20 people walking at the same time comfortably, but this one is pretty big and that'll be wonderful. So please do check the chat. And I apologize for not having this available on screen, but that's a, those are all important resources. Um, I did want to just point out again the difference between a unicursal labyrinth, which is what we're talking about for walking meditation, 
and the multicultural, which is the maze, which Alan's going to talk about related to the two films. Uh, for walking meditation, the labyrinth is a safe container. You don't have to worry. Once you make the choice to enter, everything's taken care of. No surprises or scary surprises, or you won't get lost. So you just follow the path, the one path to the center, and then you follow the same path out. And I think that um, provides for the benefits of the labyrinth are many. It quiets the mind, uh, opens the heart. You have to be receptive to what's happening now to walk it. It grounds the body. Many of us, I speak for myself, can't do setting meditation on a regular basis. I've learned over the years that movement is part of my way of being in the world, and it's just helpful to me to do walking meditation. Uh, for relaxation, uh, also for healing, and for stress management. And nowadays, it's not unusual to find a labyrinth in um a hospital setting, uh, senior citizen centers, um, mental health centers. They're really almost anywhere that you might expect to have a quiet place or even a, a garden. Not unusual. They're also very helpful in dealing with grief, as you can imagine. And then, of course, as a spiritual discipline, just for a way to connect uh, and find a connection to your inner wisdom. One thing I learned in preparing this for this presentation was that um, people who use the labyrinth regularly report that the experiences are cumulative. Just like setting meditation, the more you do it, the more you benefit. And I thought that was very helpful. Good to know. Um, Natalie, could you pull up those photographs of just a few of the labyrinths that we have that are local? I'm not sure she's. This is not a local labyrinth, but it's one at the Canuga Retreat Center in Western North Carolina. Um, and that's an example of a, a really large concrete labyrinth. This one, <laughs> this one is just a drawing. It happens to be by Lars Howler that explains where the center is. This is a seventh circuit, and circuit just means that's how many times you make the circuit in the particular pattern. And they can be three circuit, five circuit, seven, 11. We saw a picture of a 15 circuit. So they can be quite involved. And they look, the appearance is very organic, and they can be in different shapes. I've seen them heart-shaped. I've seen them in the shape of a wave. That's, you can be very creative with the shape of the labyrinth. Now, let's go to the next the picture. There we go. This is my backyard labyrinth. <laughs> and I do want to say just a few words about this. Um, I've, I've walked labyrinths for years, usually at retreat centers or um, local ones that I knew about at churches. Uh, and several years ago, the idea came to me that I just needed to make my own. We have open property. So I enlisted the help of a friend who was able to find free old bricks. My husband, who's a retired engineer, he helped me with the layout. And then I just did the physical work of putting it in place during the winter. And it's you can't really tell, but it's, but it's under two old, large pine trees. And it's a wonderful thing to just have that out there when you feel the urge to go walk the labyrinth in, in place of the sitting meditation. Um, and over time, you learn a lot about yourself if you, um, and it, take, it can take like 10 minutes to go in and to go out. But I'm showing you that just to show that uh, this labyrinth is about 26 feet across. You can see the lanes are narrow, so it's not meant for a group, but for one person. You don't need a whole lot of space, and it doesn't take expensive materials, just the manual labor and some cooperative friends that can help you find things. 
Natalie, let's see the next one. Labyrinths are often outdoors and either the desert, the woods, open prairie, even at the beach, or as uh, one of you shared, on a lake shore. This one is in Coleman, Alabama at the Sacred Heart Convent. And it's just bricks. But again, um, depending on the setting, those bricks will last a long time and require very little maintenance, just picking up leaves and pine cones or whatever. Okay, thank you. I want to talk just a few minutes about um, general guidelines for, oh, there's the one at Canuga again, the large um, one that can accommodate a group of people. And there really isn't, this is a good time to mention, there's not a lot of protocol about walking a labyrinth, uh, but it, when there are groups of people, or maybe five or six even, just common courtesy. And if there's not a facilitator there to say, why don't you start now or whatever, if common courtesy just to allow a minute or two between walkers. And the lanes are wide enough that you can go around if you need to, if you're walking faster than the person in front of you. But I want to talk a little bit about just some guidelines or walk in the labyrinth if you're the only one there and and your purpose is for walking meditation and just an opportunity to go to get quiet. That there are two things, and Lauren Artris emphasized these two as the most important things to remember in terms of how to walk the labyrinth. When you begin, just allow yourself to find your natural pace. You don't have to go fast or slow or whatever. Just breathe, slow down, and find your natural pace. And try not to have specific expectations about what's going to happen. There, uh, You may have heard from friends that they had wonderful ahas or whatever their experience was. But in actuality, each time you walk the labyrinth, it's a different experience. And it's a different experience for every person, of course. Um, and we walk it when we're undergoing different circumstances. So, of course, each experience will be different. Um, find your own way. The important thing is to experience your own experience and realize that each walk will be different. You can, um, if it's helpful, uh, journal a little bit before you enter the, the labyrinth. And even, again, as you come out after your walk, if you have things that um, you would like to reflect on later or reflect on then, that's a good idea, too. Most people walk the labyrinth silently uh, and deliberately, tuning into the present moment, what's going on. But I have seen, I do know, an Episcopal priest from Nashville who actually jogs the labyrinth. For him, that's what feels right with his energy. So, And I've seen people dance the labyrinth. So uh, you wouldn't want to do that with 10 or 15 other people on the labyrinth. But it's, it's, it's a body experience. Some people consider it a body prayer. So dancing is allowed on the labyrinth. So uh, Lauren Artris talks about three stages of walking a labyrinth, which I think can be helpful. The first one is releasing. When you enter the labyrinth, you let the rest of the world fall away and just surrender to what is, what's happening now, and be open, curious, attentive, and don't judge. If you have wacky thoughts that come up, just... Let them go. Um, just be attentive and be curious. And find your own pace. And then when you get to the center, hopefully you'll have, it won't be crowded. You can be there and stay as long as you like. Um, you can sit. You can stand. 
do whatever your body calls for at that moment. And notice what has arisen in your walk-in. It might be an image, it might be a memory, it might be um, an emotion that surprised you, it might be a sense of clarity, it might be just a sense of being held, or even a, the experience of feeling joyful that surprises you, comes from nowhere. Just again, be curious, don't judge. You may feel sadness that you are surprised about. And then after you've, when you're ready, after you've been at the center, you turn and follow the same path out. So the center is called, is referred to as receiving. And then when you exit, start your path out. That's the returning. And that's reclaiming, remembering, resolving, recollecting, or just again, just attending to how you feel or what arises, again, memories or, or sometimes images. And then sometimes people, when they get to the exit, pause and give thanks for their experience. And you can go uh, to a quiet place. Often there's benches, things adjacent to the labyrinth, and either talk with a friend or uh, journal, again, about, about your experience. But sometimes when I walk the labyrinth, uh, it's a day or two later that I might have a thought or a reflection about the walk. So don't expect that something may come up immediately. It may not. Uh, Lauren Artris also recommends that you use everything that happens while you're walking the labyrinth as a metaphor about your life. So I have seen people get turned around, especially if they try to pass someone and they get on the wrong lane and they find themselves lost in the pattern. And that can be quite frustrating. So you go back to the beginning and start. So just if that were to happen and it happens, uh, just reflect on that. Like, is there a place in your life that you feel lost? Um, anything that happens there, and as, as you make those turns in the circuits, um, it is very much like a metaphor for life. I, I was struck by, in reading the history of the labyrinth, that in the 12th century, when all those 80 cathedrals were being built in Europe in the Middle Ages, most folks were illiterate. So the 23 cathedrals that did have labyrinths as part of their um, offering that experience was like the journey to God, as well as also could be the pilgrimage to Jerusalem that they couldn't actually take physically. But it, there are a lot of twists and turns, even on a three-circuit or a five-circuit labyrinth. You retrace your steps a lot. And I do think it's wonderful that the uh, experience is cumulative. That's, that's very uh, heartening, I think, to us. Again, I, I think of the labyrinth walk as an inner experience. It's a chance to really quiet down, get in touch with what's going on inside. If you do go to a labyrinth think, expecting that and you find that it's crowded and that there are a lot of people, if you can, just shift your focus to the external experience of doing it communally. And that can be a wonderful experience as well. And the, the one that's coming up in October might just be magical to be doing it at night and be carrying a glow stick and having people around. <laughs> there will be a facilitator. Uh, I'm going to be out of town when that happens, but I would love to go. Um, that's, I hope they'll have, make that an annual event. It's wonderful. So again, those three, think of your walk as those three steps, releasing as you're going in, receiving at the center, and then the returning, when you come back out. Um, we have a short video, I hope, that we'll be able to pull up of actually someone walking the labyrinth and carrying a camera. So I wanted to, to share that with you. Um, and then let's, let's watch that. I think it's about three minutes. 
we may have a couple commercials, but it'll okay. it'll follow. <laughs> okay, thank you, Natalie. Can you see and hear it? No? no nothing's playing yet. It's, okay. it's, it's ready. It says YouTube and... Okay. For some reason, it's not letting me... Hold on. It's saying it's paused. It's paused. Yeah, hit, hit the arrow to on the go but there. Is it... Can you hear that? No. No. Oh. Let me just try. I don't know what this message is. No, I have it. I think I have it here. Okay. Let's see if I can make this work. Oops. I guess I'm going to have to share it though, right? Yeah. Well, thanks, Adil. Yeah. Right, let's see if we can. The blind leading the blind here. <laughs> Okay, I can get that bigger. It's a, I think it, it's full screen right now. Yeah. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Let's see if we can get something going here. This is a short video on how to walk a labyrinth. A labyrinth, as you may or may not know, is a beautiful array of rocks which are set in a particular pattern to make it very easy to walk and meditate as you walk. You just follow the path of the rocks as you enter into the labyrinth and just before you enter in you want to set a prayer or an intention. You want to just basically state in your heart a concern and then as you walk you practice mindfulness. You practice walking this path quietly without trying to figure things out you just allow yourself to be in a place of peace. And as you walk, you'll find that your worries will slip away. You may find that your heart turns towards things which you are grateful for. You may find that other ideas come to mind. A labyrinth has been used for centuries by various cultures there's various forms of labyrinths and the Celtics have used them as well as the Christian Church has used them over the centuries. Many, many people have found the path of the labyrinth to be a place of peace and a gentle unfolding. As we enter into the center of the labyrinth, the very center of it all. Stop and pause. Feel the energy. Feel how this is a place in the very middle. It is the place between the beginning and the end. The circle of all unfolding. Rest a moment here. Look at your surroundings. Allow the wind and the sky and the sun to meet in your heart. And then you begin to walk back out. You will again follow a path which will lead you to the end of the labyrinth. Take your time, there's no hurry. Each step walked is a step in mindful meditation. It's a step in allowing the unfolding, allowing that which will be to be is a step of trusting that there is enough for you and that all your concerns, all that bothers you, will indeed find its way to resolution. Thank you, Adele. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> The technology is challenging. Um, I'm going to 
pass it on to Alan to talk about the maze, a totally different kind of experience than the one we did with the labyrinth. Although I have to say, when I looked up labyrinth in the dictionary, it included mazes. It was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a lot of conflation now in our culture. I don't think most people know the difference. And I certainly didn't before we had our board meeting about this. And so uh, we got into a discussion about labyrinths and mazes and the difference between the two and thought that it might be a good idea to to just clarify that and to bring in examples from uh, the culture um, and uh, and and art that is responsible for uh, confusing the, the notion. Um, so again, a labyrinth uh, in the way that we're stressing today, it, it's unicursal, which means that you can uh, you can draw the path of a labyrinth without picking up your pen on a piece of paper. A maze is multicursal, which means you're going to be picking it up and um, there's going to be, uh, there might be multiple exits, uh, no clear center. Um, but um, as I was looking into this, I think, um, you know, the, the, the labyrinth is a beautiful archetypal tool, sort of an idealized uh, uh, pattern for finding one center, not only because it's circle, but because it's a spiral. And this uh, while Adele was talking, I thought of the Fibonacci sequence in math, which is the um, it's a fundamental principle of biology and nature. It it, uh, it creates the spiral and pine cones and so many forms that you see in nature. And um, it's it, it, I think it's even in the DNA uh, helix that forms our genetic material. But um, uh, but the maze. So the the maze is used a lot in art and. Um, uh, just some really great artists have um, explored uh, the the idea and uh, and s sort of blended the two notions. I think uh, whenever you see the labyrinth in a movie or a book, it's going to have a psychological edge to it, and um, it, it, it oftentimes it's it the it involves a protagonist, a, a main character in the story who's trying to figure themselves out. Um, before I give some examples of uh, of uh, uh, movies and books uh, dealing with this, I just want to say that. Um, I, uh, I was reading Jung's uh, Symbols of Transformation book, which he uh, wrote when he was uh, breaking up with Freud in the uh, in around 1911, 1912. Um, but he in that book, he zeroes in on a lot of archetypal material. And he also addresses the uh, the the matrix or the labyrinth in that book and he ties it to a mother symbol uh so it's it's a feminine symbol of uh, which is often tied to the mystical or the inner experience uh in um in in psychology and Lauren Artress, the book that we've uh, been referencing in this talk uh, a lot, the woman who has, who's the past, the, I think, deacon in um, in San Francisco, um, she also talks about it being a feminine symbol. But I just noticed that a lot of, of um, art out there that uses the labyrinth or the maze, uh, there's a strong correlation to uh, womanhood or motherhood. Um, I just thought that was interesting. And um, the the labyrinth itself in these works, often if the labyrinth that we've been discussing uh, earlier in this talk is a kind of a tool of clarity and finding one center, in these works of art, it's more about exploring what Jung called the complex, which is like it sounds, it's an unconscious structure down there where you're not aware of it, but it it has energy, and it's generally an issue, uh, like like an an issue from your past that takes on that takes on energy and emotion, and it can't be untangled easily. Um, if we had an example, would be if we had a uh, difficult mother or difficult father, we would develop a mother or father complex. And then 
we would kind of project that outwards um, onto the world because we couldn't really solve it. We weren't really aware of how to untangle it unless we go to therapy or make art about it and bring it to light. Um, so all these works of art, and I'll mention them now, they deal with this kind of entanglement um, that's in the unconscious. Um, the first ones that I thought about were Jim Henson's Labyrinth, which is from 1986, which is uh, a uh, film with David Bowie. And it's about a young girl, Sarah, who is on the cusp of, uh, she's a teenager on the cusp of adulthood, and she's working out these uh, issues. Her mother uh, has ran off with an actor who is a lot like David Bowie. And so she creates this sort of projective labyrinth that she actually steps into with David Bowie, the Goblin King at its core. So she's working out this complex in, she's made it concrete, and then she's working out this issue that she couldn't attack directly. Uh, and she's, and then she's, it's a wonderful film if, if you haven't seen it, but she wanders the labyrinth and, and finds herself at the center eventually. Um, and um and figures out uh and 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 uh and sort of brings to light that that complex um another film is pan's labyrinth by guillermo del toro that came out 20 years later in 2006 and um that's also about a young girl on the cusp of teenagehood growing up who um is confronted with a really dysfunctional family situation and she also turns to turns to fantasy towards the concrete manifestation of fantasy, uh, which involves a labyrinth in order to work out these issues of a of the dark father and of uh, growing up and becoming a woman herself. Um, and um, I thought of a I thought of uh, other examples like um, there's a wonderful writer named Jorge Borges who's uh, Argent Argentina's greatest writer, I think. And um, he wrote a celebrated collection of short stories called Labyrinths. And um, that's all about um, inner contemplation going. He, he had a love of libraries and uh, books. He was a philologist and, um, and obsessed with reading. And it was his mother who instilled that in him. And so the the subtext of labyrinths is all about going into the library going into learning and reading and figuring out um he's he's figuring out himself through these stories figuring out what is reality um so it's very um introspective and contemplative using lots of meta metaphors related to labyrinths and um and it's it's just a great work of art and related to this um, idea of the maze labyrinth. Um, but you um, you see this. I, I'm I'm just throwing out some ideas here. I'm sorry if I'm rambling or bringing up issues that are uh, Jungian terms that are kind of uh, that require some unpacking. But um, but uh, there's I just noticed some patterns between uh, a lot of these. Uh, these works. I, I've got a, I can put some other a list of other um, artistic products in the, um, in the comments too, that I think follow this kind of pattern as well. Um, and uh, I think that's all I have to say. I hope any of that uh, resonates or that people might have some comments about how the labyrinth might be a, a symbol that you've come across Um or a maze in, in in a psychological way or a reflective uh, spiritual way that um that we could tie to a movie or a book or something like that yes gail you're muted gail i of course understand how the maze and the labyrinth are very different but i see one commonality is they both um throw you off of using the rational mind to to get to what you're to the center 
and in the maze, and you're just so confounded, you can't really solve it rationally. You almost are forced to use intuitive gifts and other things, relationships, yes. whatever, like in the Henson movie. Um, I, I really, yeah, I really think the maze and the labyrinth are the the two sides of the same coin. Yes. What what it represents is the unconscious. Um, what, on the one hand, you have the labyrinth as wholeness and as the clear path, what Jung called individuation, the process of individuation, coming to your center and, um, and a realization um, and, um, and your world expanding. The, on the other hand, you have the maze which is, you know, going into the unconscious can be difficult and, and laborious and um, com complicated. Yeah, uncontrollable. Uncontrollable. I mean, yeah, you're not controlling it all. That's why a therapist is a good sort of guide for the labyrinth. Um, you know, it's um, a, it's almost like uh, there's that original myth of Theseus, um, which is the most well-known myth tied to a labyrinth. Uh, Theseus goes and kills the Minotaur at the uh, at Knossos in Crete, and um, he only does it because he has Ariadne, uh, the king's daughter, to help him with that ball of thread. It's like, um, I, I think a good therapist or even just someone who's um, who's reading or doing the work can can will take that ball of thread in with them so they don't lose the thread of their own story and it can lead them into the unconscious and out um and without getting lost in um in in the you know the the sort of blind alleyways that we can fall into when we start digging up the past and uh digging up trauma or um or um, getting too focused on an issue that's not important, you know, not essential to uh, to uh, ex you know the full realization of our greatest gifts. So, well said, thanks, Alan. I'd I'd like to add a few thoughts to that, and I'm also remembering our board meeting on this topic. We were got quite excited about it, but it strikes me if you look at a, a, a so this is goes along with what you just said. An additional perspective might be that that comes from meditation in the sense of presence, being present with what you're doing. And th in that sense, I remember a sort of a light going on in my own head, oh, maze versus labyrinth. And it strikes me that from a standpoint of presence, even meditation involves moving your feet and being conscious of the movement of your feet. So there's a, an element of peace with the labyrinth. Namely, there's a single pathway. You don't need to worry about it. You just follow it and allow yourself to settle with that. On the other hand, it strikes me that the myth is the maze, I'm sorry, is quite different, but it's all, it's all, again, there is a way out and it's an echo of another aspect of life where it's not just peaceful feet being present. The mind is very active. I have to make choices all along. And maybe something of, an, of, a, of a layer there is the maze, maze also has a way through. And our life goes through twists and turns and we can all point to, oh, I made a real switch and turn in my maze of my life. So that's that's an overlay that I see from that sense of being present in the moment. Yeah, I think I think expressing that there's a way out of a maze as well is is key too. Yeah, that, that's great. Lynn Cohen, do you have anything to say? Um, thank you. No, I'm just interested in learning and listening a lot. So I appreciate it, but thanks. Margaret, how about you from Los Angeles? You're you're muted. Margaret, you're Margaret, muted. Margaret had something to say. Mm -hmm. Oh. Well we're waiting for Margaret though. Okay. There we go. It occurred to me that when we were, how much the mandala and the labyrinth kind of echo each other. And 
I have to think this through because it just came kind of came to me that the, the mandala sort of is involved in the upper body, the kinesthetic parts of the upper body, whereas the mandala is more involved with the lower body. And I, I'm just curious about that as it's come to me. I'm, I'm wondering if what that's about or if it's about anything. May I make a personal comment to that? Yes. <clears throat> During the time that I was working on the Jung film project, and was uh, was with Dieter Baumann, the grandson of Jung, inside Jung's tower, and walking up the stairs there, what I saw on the wall, my brother and I were there, actually didn't surprise me. What I saw were mandala images that he had painted on the wall, on, on the inside of the tower. And I came from a family of filmmakers, and my uncle, James Whitney, had made a number of films based on mandalas. So it, it seemed to me there was a consonance. It was in a very similar time frame in the 60s or earlier when the films were being made by my uncle Jim and when Jung was doing that with mandala. So I, 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 what from that, that, there's just a sense of consonance that travels throughout. It, it's really a, um, it's not just a Western uh, symbol, you know, it, it's an Eastern symbol too. I went here in Nashville, I went to our Wild Heart Meditation Center. It's a Zen meditation center. And uh, I'm not as a Zen Buddhist, but I did participate in their rituals. And um, one of the things we did was walk in a spiral. We walked very slowly. Um, it was a very similar ritual to what we're discussing today. Um, and I, I'm not sure how old this is, if it maybe it could be Western influence, um, in, in, in with that, but, um, but it's definitely taken hold of in, in the temple, the Zen temples. I don't know whether, um, I can, um, verbalize the difference in two very different experiences with walking the, the labyrinth. Um, the one, obviously, when first one gets instructions and there are certain suggestions being made, it's it's fairly easy, uh, or it was easy for me to kind of see the analogous aspect of walking the many turns and, 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 and being self-reflective with respect to my life, finding the center, walking back out. And it had in itself benefits. Obviously, there is a calming down. There's the self-reflections. There is the meditational aspect of like being, being very much in the moment. And then also, uh, to, to, uh, but, but it was, it was guided by these ideas that had been, that I had been given, right? I mean, like you can take a very, that's why when you, when you, when you first walk a, 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 a labyrinth in, in a church and somebody, you know, makes certain references to like the center is God and, and and they're talking about the the six petaled rose setter as is representative of Christ, and, you know. And and there there then you go in there with certain ideas in your head. That not that there's anything wrong with it. Again, as I, I felt that those walks have been very beneficial when I took them. However, when as Gail suggested earlier, when I was able to walk in different places and. Um, and just really with a pretty much a completely open mind, really not thinking anything. Then I had what I guess people refer to as this solvitura ambulando. I mean, like it is solved by walking. Mm. That there's some mm. aspect to this, just this physical getting your body into motion mm. and walking that something is released. And, and I've had the same, I learned uh, that in, like when 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 conducting like psychodramas, there is this el uh, element of of of, of soliloquies. When 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 the when the when the, uh, the the protagonist gets stuck in in the story, right? Like so, using maybe a maze, he's suddenly stuck in this in this in this scene. That that the therapist takes him out of the scene, and, and they're just walking. They're just walking. And by just walking in, in, you know, physically walking, suddenly he becomes unstuck. And, uh, and I thought that was very interesting for me personally, because I mean, that, that happens, stuff happens then that I did not anticipate or that were not directed by, by something that somebody told, told me or that, that somebody suggested, but just by physically walking and, and just, you know, suddenly 
uh, I don't know, some insights, some things come to me. Problems suddenly, I never had a handle on, suddenly become, I go up in smoke. It's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty peculiar thing. I do not, I do not know why that happens. Um, I have no idea, but it fascinates me. It fascinates me that this, this solved to Ambulando, uh, that it is solved by walking, that the, that the physical activity can release things in my head. I, I find that fascinating. That's it. <laughs> yeah, well put. I think walking does relax the ego too. Like it can, um, you know, doing any sort of activity that's has a gentle rhythm to it um, relaxes the ego a, a bit so that all those anxious voices that we all have in our head, that chain, that chatter uh, sort of goes to bed a little, little bit. <laughs> Isn't there an, an additional layer to that? It brings us back to creaturehood. We are, after all, simply creatures. And that's very old. Um, there's a lot to be said for um, the mind-body connection anyway. A lot more than I can intelligently articulate, but there is the strong connection between the mind and the body and in terms of emotional well-being. Um, one other thing that did occur to me earlier when um, we were looking at, Adele, I think, Adele's slides early on um, were the um, dates of labyrinths and mm -hmm. um, looking back to the, I think it was Paleolithic period. And mm -hmm. I was wondering about what that says about human mm -hmm. consciousness. Mm -hmm that many years ago. Um, so anyway, it was just an observation I made. I, I don't, that's a great question. And I don't have an answer, although it just, I think what Geard's saying about it's solved by walking, maybe that's just part of our instinctive nature that, that we could, there's something to be gained from walking in a circle. Um, but it is it is amazing to think that that was that back that far in history. Linda, would you? Uh, this may be not too uh, technical, but. Um, there is a psychotherapeutic tool, some of you may know, called EMDR, and it involves stimulating, alternating stimulation to both sides of the brain. And walking is actually another form of bilateral stimulation. And so what that does is it connects the left brain and the right brain so that you gain access to stuff that's been stored away or left in the unconscious. So that's just another way of saying what you all are saying, that uh, walking allows us access to things that we might not otherwise have. And that um, a lot of access to what has been unconscious material. And that sometimes uh, leads us into profound and very meaningful experiences that can feel like a surprise. I think one benefit of doing it outside too, walking a labyrinth outside is actually taking your shoes off and walking the labyrinth in your bare feet. Um, you know, they, they say if you ever feel ungrounded, just touch the ground, <laughs> just, just make contact with the ground. And Linda, I wanted to mention, uh, I'm an EMDR practitioner, and uh, Dr. Shapiro, who invented it, um, she 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 tells or told the story. She's passed now, but that she was hiking in California and thinking of she had cancer at the time. She'd just gotten that diagnosis, and so she was 
thinking about it, and she noticed as she was hiking, her eyes were moving back and forth, that bilateral stimulation, and she felt better. So, uh, yeah, I think walking is a wonderful form of EMDR. <laughs> so, well, well in, 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 to uh, latch on to what you just said, Karen, uh, there, there's also the story that, you know, that's how she actually came up with the EMDR uh, technique because she, she was wondering about rapid eye movement in dream, in a dream state. Mm -hmm. But we all have that in our eyes. And what is happening there? And so she she actually, on her walks, she would actually intentionally, particularly when she struggled with an issue, would intentionally move her eyes left and right, left and right, knowing that it might stimulate both brain hemispheres. Uh, and, and so she thought there must be a connection when she experienced some, 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 uh, you know, positive impact from doing it that way. But that is that, you know, that gets us like now we're talking about like dreamland and we're really like now we're, now we're back to Jung, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, what we, we are all about all the time and in, in our coming together to explore Jungian thought really is about how to make friends with the unconscious, how to allow mm -hmm. more parts of ourselves to come into our awareness. And, and, and that's really what wholeness and individuation mm -hmm. is. So these are just all the different ways to approach that or think about that. What I was going to say earlier to Alan, as as you were talking, is it gives a whole another meaning to that's amazing. <laughs> so, so I'll think about that every time I use it in the future. So thank you, Adele. Well, I was going to say we we've got a, a little bit more time. We'd hoped maybe just to kind of open this up to discussion, especially anybody might want to share, uh, like Geard just did. Uh, an experience you had walking in a labyrinth and, and any insights you gained from it. And I will kick it off. And I had some very simple insights. I, first time I walked one, like a guided one, was a workshop. <clears throat> and I was at this union retreat in North Carolina, this journey into wholeness. We'd been listening to lectures all morning sitting. And I thought, I had to sign up for some sort of workshop, and I thought this one at least will be moving. And that was about my, that was the level of my expectation. I just want to move around. But I was very surprised when I did this, these very obvious connections. Maybe all of you've walked it, had these. That's why I'm curious. The very first thing that hit me was that I was circling back around where I'd already been, which I thought was a good metaphor for things that were going on in my life because we're often revisiting some old issue that we thought we'd figured out years ago about our career or our relationship or something. And here you are, you're back at that same place, but maybe you're a little bit, you've widened yeah. the circle, you know, you're, but you can kind of see where you've been. That was interesting. Like I could see, then I also had the thought, I cannot see the center. I can't see where I'm going, but I know I'm going to get there. If I just put one foot in front of the other, I don't have to see where I'm going. And like I say, those same like very elementary insights, but that was powerful for me because it was very comforting to think, okay, that's another good metaphor for my life. I just keep putting one foot in front of doing the next right thing. I don't have to see where it's leading necessarily. I just have to trust it's leading to where I need to go. So, but I'd enjoy hearing anybody else, any experiences you had for I, I hey. Elizabeth there oh, thanks sorry um yeah just as you were talking about that Adele I think my one of my first experiences doing a labyrinth it was a, a canvas but being unfamiliar with the process I was struck with how often I kept looking towards the center and I was going further away. It was not linear. <laughs> it was not 
you know, I think that is a metaphor mm-hmm. for my life. It's like, I expect things to go in a certain pattern. You do this, you do that, that, and it all builds to be this perfection or whatever. Um, and it is not that. And it is constantly going away from what you think mm-hmm. the, the motive, I mean, the, the end is, or the, the center, um, the perfection, the place uh, that you want to be in. There's a constant back and forth almost. You're getting closer and then you're going far away, you're getting closer and far away. And I think, you know, I think my children really struggle with this. I think I presented life to them mm-hmm. as you do this, 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 and this, and it all just goes and you're there. Um, but the labyrinth shows that it, the wisdom in life is that it is not that linear experience it is a constantly going back and forth and back and forth and then if you relax into it if you accept the ups and downs of life or the the far and the near you you do come to experience something more whole at the center and that's not the end either you know and then you then you go back out you're the returning part um i think that's fascinating but i didn't until you mentioned that adele i did not think about my experience before but that's that's what it's been for me is this moving back and forth and not understanding for a while that it is just in the walking and allowing it allowing that journey to be something different than i thought it was going to be you know i love elizabeth that you mentioned this obvious thing that that the metaphor of that life is not a linear journey. Although I think most of us somehow, I don't know how we got that message, but we did from most, most all of us, right. That we yeah. sort of thought we just childhood, adulthood. You, and a lot of us thought it was like this, you know, you go up and your life kind mm-hmm. of peaks and then old age is just going to be this downhill journey. <clears throat> and I went through an interesting, well, life coach training program at a place called the Hudson Institute out in Santa Barbara. And it was all built around the idea that life is more cyclical and that Mm -hmm. our journey is not like this, but it's more like this all the way to the end. So thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. Linda? Linda. You know, it, it, listening to you guys, it occur, I love the, the the thing about everything's a spiral. We keep spiraling back. It seems like we're going backwards at times, but we're always moving to more awareness, more consciousness. But what came to my mind as you guys were talking was the first three of the 12 steps. I don't know how many of you are familiar with those. But I thought, you know, walking the labyrinth is like an experience of surrender. Mm. Because you don't know where you're going, um, and you just have to have faith that if you follow, mm-hmm. even though sometimes it seems like you're going in that, or you're going backwards, or you're going the opposite direction. Um, you know, you you will get to something that feels like the center, whatever that is for you. Uh, the The second step of the twelve steps is. Uh, came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. And I thought that's like an embodiment of this second step to have that experience of the labyrinth. And what what a, a gift that is. Even if you don't consciously get it, probably unconsciously we do. Jamie had her hand up. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, I am. Um... I've actually walked that labyrinth in Borrego Springs. Um, It Mm -hmm. was several years ago. Uh, I used to live in Borrego Springs back in the 1980s and had a mentor that lived there. And he had been my mentor for over 20 years. And I'd gone back to Borrego Springs to say goodbye to him because he was getting ready to pass on. And at the same time in my life, somebody from 25 years past had popped back in. And it was... It really interesting because I, I traveled quite a bit. And at one point in my life, I thought maybe I had a stalker because I would be in the middle of the desert in Arizona and somebody would say, hey, somebody was just asking if Jamie Givens was here. Or I'd be in a bar in Sun Valley, Idaho, and somebody would say, 
oh, I didn't think you actually existed. There's this guy just here, you know? And so in all my travels, there would be somebody that had just been there looking for me. And this person from 25 years popped into my life to say, yeah, that was me. And I have unfinished business with you. I need to talk to you about. <laughs> and so I had this interesting life cycle experience, right? And so I was very disoriented and I wanted to honor my mentor and our unfinished business. And I wanted to integrate the other information that was coming. So I went up, I went for a hike. It was over a two mile round trip hike to Palm Canyon, where it's a beautiful desert oasis and California palms are there and water. And uh, I walked in the method of Thich Nhat Hanh, um, a very, although he's more of a Theravada Buddhist, um, that Zazen tradition, you know, heel to toe, methodic, um, tried to empty out. And I got back into the rental car and I was driving and I drove kind of this little different way and it was right next to uh, the church. I can't remember if it's a Catholic or Episcopalian church, but I saw the labyrinth out of my periphery and I <laughs> whipped the car around and parked in the par church parking lot and kind of looked around to hope I didn't get in trouble. And um, I went ahead and walked the labyrinth. And that was what I was looking for. The walk, the, the, the walking meditation to Palm Canyon and back didn't really settle me. And, and reorientate me. It was the, the walk in that Borrego Springs labyrinth. And, you know, that center is like a womb. You know, it's it's no mystery to me why it's associated to the feminine uh, symbolism is because that inner, when you, once you get there, it's almost like a, a being in a womb and then walking back out. And it really was the trick that I needed that, biohack that I needed to get me back grounded so I could finish my trip. And um, I, I feel like there's, I, I'm dyslexic and I've used brain gym quite a bit in my life to reconnect the nervous system, you know, when it glitches out, so to speak, Let's say if you, we were doing kinesiology or something and muscle testing. And I, I wonder if there's some sort of that synchronization uh, that we get from those brain gym exercises where we're doing the elephant trunk, uh, it's, it's, it does something somatically uh, that the labyrinth does. So thank you for letting me share my story. Thank you. And Robert had a hand up. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with the video, but uh, I'd like to share briefly a, an experience I had some 25 years ago uh, when I walked the labyrinth at Sharks. Um, I arrived uh, at the cathedral uh, about sunup, and uh, it was very dark inside. Um, I could hardly see anything. I could see no people. Uh, I don't think that there was anyone else there. Um, and so I, I got a candle from the candle table and lit it and uh, walked into the center where I, I found the labyrinth. And I started walking in it uh, with no real anticipation of what I would experience. Uh, but the atmosphere was um, very um, abstract, shall I say, and um, as I walked it, I, I, I honestly felt like I, I was no longer physically there. I, I had left my body. Uh, I was experiencing the, the labyrinth and the environmental uh, conditions of that cathedral. Uh, and as far as I know, I was the only one in the cathedral, and it was profoundly uh, it profoundly affected me uh, emotionally and uh, every other way that I could think of. Um, when I finished it, um, I had no sense of time um, and I had no specific 
experience from it. Uh, it, it was an enigma, honestly. Um, th there was an experience, but it was not describable. Um, and the only single idea that I could later construct of that experience was an idea of unity. Mm. And that was it. That was enough to explain my experience. And that uh, mm. experience has profoundly affected me and the way I think about things and the way I experience things uh, ever since. Uh, probably one of the most profound experiences of my life. Mm. Um, and that's that was it. Now, there was another labyrinth at the on the outside of the cathedral, uh, and I started to walk it, but I had no experience, uh, no sense of anything I had inside the cathedral, so I stopped doing that. But that was, I, I would just like to share that uh, one experience I had at Shards. Thank you. That sounds really incredible. <laughs> Numinous, yeah. yeah. Wow. I'm thinking it would be really fun for the Nashville Young Circle. Might as well think big. Maybe <laughs> we could take together a group and take a field trip to France to go walk <laughs> the short <Chardonnay> right. <laughs> That would be awesome. I, I'm I'm reminded, Robert, that um, Lauren Archer talks about the reason that that labyrinth survived at that cathedral is because the stone it was made of actually hardened with use over time and in the other churches that the labyrinths were not remaining the stone was actually worn out from mm. all the walking on it over the hundreds of years so that's, that's interesting that uh that coincides with my experience um there um and and the the one sense that I had of the entire experience was uh, there was something uh, outside of my normal experience. Uh, mm -hmm. I ha having to walk that with the candle, so I could only see a few feet mm -hmm. in any direction. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so I literally walking in the dark. Yeah. That's extraordinary. Mm. Mm. Speaking about uh, candle, I, I'm reminded of a Jewish tradition of a yard site candle. And it, 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 I think it relates to our conversation because it, it has to do with a response to mortality. Oh. And the, the yard site candle is the candle that burns for a single night that you you light on the anniversary of someone who has been close to you of their death. And what you see is that the power of the single candle in the middle of the light illuminates the entire space and it's flickering and life is flickering and it's known that it will go out. So I think related to Robert's sense of the power of the candle that he was handling, I think that expresses a tradition that incorporates that same sensibility. Uh, Robert, I also appreciate the metaphor of I could only see a few feet in front of me. Um, I think that's powerful. Thank you for that. Well, that, to me, that uh, the experience was that uh, I was there and present, but there was clearly something outside of that area, mm. but I was only, I was limited to a few feet of that experience at mm. the time, being well aware of, of a larger existence. You know, I think all of this illustrates something, uh, it, like one of the first the questions I put at the beginning, then one of them was, why why are people interested in union psychology interested in labyrinths? What's the connection of this labyrinth subject to union psychology? And I think 
another connection that the obvious the symbols that we talk about is coming from the archetypal collective unconscious but also the importance that Jung stressed and, and people like Robert Johnson when I heard him speak because I was at a number of these conferences where he was there the importance of performing some sort of ritual mm -hmm. embodying just taking some idea and not just he would say you can't just think about it. You need to perform some kind of ritual, whether you write it down on a piece of paper and burn it or making up your own ritual. But this walking of the labyrinth is, in, is a ritual, you know, and I think a lot of us may feel like we don't have a lot of rituals left in our lives. And um, so any way we can, can find, maybe you create your own rituals, but this is a good one, I think, for a lot of people, it sounds like. Anyone else have a personal story or a comment they want to make or share? Um, Adele, I, just from what you just said, uh, borrowing from your idea, let's all get on a plane and go to France. <laughs> um, you know, it's sad that we couldn't have this experience together today. But maybe mm -hmm. this, what we're doing today, prepares us to have that experience together. I agree. And I'd like us to continue thinking about a possible time to do that. Mm. And especially and, if it's outside, mm. that right. would be safer than if it were inside. And as, as Gail pointed out, and we could try to find another time to meet, we were going to walk the one at Glendale Methodist Church which is outside, and uh, but the one at Scarrett Bennett is a bigger, more elaborate labyrinth. Um, you can't reserve that for your group. You just have to go, and it is open to the public. Mm -hmm. But but sure, I think mm -hmm. that's if, if some people are interested in that, maybe let us know. And we're going to follow up, as I said, with this talk today with these resources in the newsletter that will be coming out in a couple of weeks. So... It, it might be nice to turn a labyrinth walk into a ritual, into a cyclic ritual that we do every year. Yeah, that's a great yeah. idea. Yeah, we check, yeah. we check in every year into the, and yeah. Okay. yeah. I think we decided, you know, I don't know if some of you followed the, the uh, strange labyrinth. We were more of a maze of how we were going to get around to having this in-person event. We tried to reschedule it three different times and life kept getting in the way, whether it was COVID, illness or problems of various people who were going to help lead it. And this fourth time that we decided this isn't going to work in person, <clears throat> we thought, well, maybe we're getting a message here. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is like Linda said, maybe it's better to do it this way first where we can actually go into some history and and let people learn more about it instead of just showing up to walk it so mm -hmm. i agree now we could do that and we have all this context for it and right. Adele, we had another step to that too which is that we felt with the zoom we could get people from different parts of the country and that that that's kind of a, a matrix of its own right. uh, that, that this has and i don't i'm being a little bit bold here i see uh, uh reverend donna whitney had expressed an interest to attend related to the 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 church community here and i don't know if you want to say anything donna about what that was but or i'm not putting you on the spot oh thanks i'm just interested maybe in establishing um a labyrinth at a church property where I volunteer. Um, so this was of interest and I'll pass it on to the senior pastor there in North Nashville. Um, my own experience walking the labyrinth has been at Scarrett Bennett when I was a Div student. And there was a group of us who would periodically do that together. And it, this, um, this conversation has been interesting to me, making me revisit those times. I would finish walking the labyrinth and think, eh, you know, not a whole lot happened. But year, weeks, months, even years later, if I just think back to those moments, I feel centered. I feel as if my pulse is slowing. Um, so I, I appreciated the comments about kind of the after effects. And I, I think the immediate effect probably was muted 
um, by too much grad student talk. <laughs> Speaking of students, is it Dokin? Am I pronouncing your name right? Your <coughs> hey, yeah, it's Lauren Dokin. You talking? Yeah, I, I could share a little bit of my experience. It's a little tender, um, so it's not super easy to share. But I wrote a couple notes. Uh, so it was four years ago that I did my first one when I was thirty-four years old. Um, and it was three months after, to keep it short, like a tower episode happened in my life, like the tarot, like, you know, your whole life just comes crashing down um, cool. with, you know, my marriage changing and I was stay at home mom raising two year old and five year old. So a couple. Yeah. So I go into this prayer labyrinth and um, not sure what to expect. And once I get to the middle, I am just I'm seven or eight years old and. <laughs> It was so dark and so scary. And I just like held myself and shook and was just like, why is no one here? Why am I alone? There should be someone around loving on me. Uh, like what is happening? So it's essentially that is, you know, my childhood being alone starting at age seven or eight years old. So I was brought to that and it was kind of like a foretelling of what was to come because I didn't start living alone with my, you know, just raising my small kids until January of 2020. And as you know, like everything shut down just a couple months later. So it was like, here I am, I'm alone. I'm raising two kids. I have no family, no help around. Like it was mm. wild. Um, so I went through a maze uh, to get to where I am now, four years later. And uh, I am, it's just really cool how it's, synchronized into my life to like revisit that moment that was so scary because I'm living it out now and it's not so scary. It's actually just the most beautiful thing ever. <laughs> and so I'm looking forward to uh, doing one again because I think it would be a completely different experience. It would be. Thank you for sharing that. I, I have heard many people report that walking the labyrinth is particularly helpful during times of big transition in their lives. Um, and that makes a lot of sense that it would be. Yeah. I, I love that you mentioned the, the tarot. I'm a tarot card reader. And um, those last seven cards of the major arcana in the tarot are sort of like a, the spiritual component of the major arcana. And the tower comes right at the beginning of that. Um, it's kind of, if the, the devil's kind of the confrontation with your, your own darkness, then the tower sweeps all that away. And at the end of the major arcana, you have that, um, you have the world card with the beautiful, the, the woman dancing in the center, you know, of, of the, what could be seen as the labyrinth, you know, it's, it's, it's that wholeness and that, that dance at the end. Um, so that, that, that's, yeah, beautiful. That's very cool. So I'm noticing, so we've been together now for an hour and 45 minutes or so. And I'm noticing that it is though we have been walking a labyrinth together and we've come to deeper and deeper places mm -hmm. uh, in, in our share and in our, what we are bringing into our awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that's very moving to me, uh, and I'm grateful for this experience and for what each of you has been willing to share. Thanks, Linda. You're muted, Gail. Thank you, Linda, for saying that. And and I would encourage people to check out those websites there and YouTube. There is a wealth of information available about the labyrinth. It's amazing to me. And there's so many in our community that it's not hard to find one that's available. Donna, I didn't leave your comments. That was quite gripping how you talked about your your own sense of reflecting back on the experience that didn't hit you at the moment. I, I didn't cut you short from I went did you have something more to say, or I didn't want to cut you short on anything? No, that was it. Thanks. Hmm. 
I wanted to say that this is my, I think, third young uh, Nashville circle event, I guess you'd say, and how much I appreciate them and how much I appreciate what you put together. I really, really enjoy these and so look forward to it. So I, I just wanted to throw that out while we're all still together and thinking about it. I mean, I, I'm just really pleased in my new city that this exists. It's a gift. <laughs> Margaret, you know, that's that's the uh, absolute uh, currency of our talk as a board is that each of us is 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 seeking our own in, in inner sense of what what's difficult that the community is feeling. And and I think that that it, and Karen and Linda, uh, Gail, Adele, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, that I feel that that's really the essence of what. So it's very heartfelt for me to hear what you've just said, because we're always looking to see where we may be related to our community. We had a session on gun violence where we had real violence here in Nashville and some follow-up from that. So the, the, the process we go through is, is there a way we can add some roots that are informed by the depth that Jung seems to express so well? Uh, so that's really... <laughs> Really nice to hear what you just said, Margaret. Yeah, no, I, I do appreciate, so appreciate it. I look forward to them. I'd like to say something that I really appreciate with this group. Okay, um, so basically, I was my mind was blown the entire two hours of listening to Lionel Corbett. Was that his name? I just watched that a couple days ago, and then uh, months and months back when I first heard of you guys. Um, Jerry Wright. So I started mm -hmm. and I ordered two of his books and um, I'm terrible about finishing a book, but I've started both. But that's what I'm personally like so interested in is uh, the God image and um, the self stuff like that. So I just want to say I'm so thankful for Jerry Wright and Lionel Corbett and everything, like every word and every sentence. I like just my mind has just been blown. So just want to thank y'all. That's good to hear because we just started in the last, what, year or so, taping these and putting them up on a YouTube channel with the help of Natalie. I don't know if, I don't think Natalie's still on today, but yeah, there you are. There's Natalie. <laughs> uh, so we're glad and we're, this will be, this is being recorded and, and hopefully we'll have this one posted soon as well. And just so you'll know, we are a little bit trying to solve the puzzle of whether to go back to having in-person events at some point, because doing these Zoom events does allow us to reach a larger audience and people outside of Nashville. So we'd enjoy getting some feedback from all of you. Mm -hmm. Harriet? Yes, I, I'm not muted. Okay. Had, ah. I'm, all right, I'll just talk. I had to move, so in, the, in my house. So I'm asking, the Lionel Corbett presentation is on YouTube. Is that correct? Is, did I hear you say that? It is. All right. I, I have to say, I want to watch it two or three more times. That is one of the best presentations I think I've ever seen. The whole gun violence thing. And I just so appreciate your having it. Well, the, the gun violence was Glenn Slater. Are you oh, so oh, the oh yes, I've gotten mixed up. So yeah, I watched the Corbett too. So Glenn Slater, that's my that was my question. Is it on YouTube as well? Um, no, it's not. Um, he wanted it just for the members that were. I don't, we I'll have to get back to you if you really want to know. But he did not want that posted on our YouTube channel. That's the simple answer. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Lionel Corbett was one of my professors when I was at Pacifica Graduate Institute. He, uh, he's certainly one of my top three uh, professors there. I should, maybe this is going on YouTube. Maybe I should say it, qualify it like that. But um, he has several books. Uh, he's, he's incredible. So uh, I'm glad that you all like him. And so is Glenn. And Glenn, uh, is mostly an editor. And, um, you know, if, if you can ever see him, uh, I think Pacifica does, um, 
oh, what are they called, Natalie? These uh, public, you know, workshops or something. So if you ever can see him in person, he's he's just amazing. So I'm so glad that you all are speaking up and talking about this. We would love to do more for our community. Uh, there's only seven of us um on the board like we would love to do a book club we would love to go see films and talk about them maybe once a month or so uh i think a lot of it is just finding the time and the resources and the people uh but you know have faith uh and we'll try and get that done um any last words before we wrap up today anyone so appreciate you all being here and uh one day we'll all be in person so uh take care thank you so much thank you bye everybody bye bye, bye. 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 thanks everybody bye, -bye. thank you bye.